I just want to spend a few moments this evening reflecting on a short little passage in Hebrews. Uh, Some of you may be familiar with this passage. It gives us the image of life as a race and that we are running a race and that we can easily get entangled and burdened down with things. This is what sin does. It burdens us and it entangles us and keeps us from running the race well. And the image that that is in there is this image of entanglement. Now, there's a lot of things that can get tangled up and they're all not good. Um, I grew up fishing with my dad and bass fishing and crappie fishing around here. And because I was not paying attention to what was going on, um, I over um, filled the reel or did it too loosely or tried casting into the wind, which is never really a good thing. Um, And I'd always end up with this crow's nest or this bird's nest, uh, a mess of things. That's not what you want to see when you're fishing is tanglement. Or... I remember one time where my mom's jewelry box got knocked over off her, the, the cabinet that it was, was on, the dresser that it was on, and it just turned everything inside out in, in there. And she pulled out this big old mess of jewelry. Uh, this is not it, but a big old mess of jewelry. And I was right there, and she got so mad because she couldn't pull the stuff apart, and she actually asked me to pull some of it uh, apart with it. I can still remember this day. What a mess that tangle was. Or maybe, maybe this you can relate to. Tangled hair that just gets into a massive knot that, Lord willing, you can figure a way to to get it out, but sometimes it requires the scissors, just like with the the fishing line. Or maybe it's something like this. Uh, You're out hiking and you run across a vine like this. This is called the wait-a-minute vine. And we don't have any of it here. We got blackberries and all that kind of stuff here. But if, if you get off trail, and these vines are nasty. They're called wait-a-minute vines because they have these thorns on it, and they grab you, and they don't let go. And when you get caught up into these thorns when you're trying to hike, the person would inevitably, wait a minute, I need to get this uh, taken off and, and, and dealt with because I can't move any further. I'm stuck. Or maybe you're walking your dog and the dog decides to go around your legs and around the other person's legs and gets everybody entangled up. It's not the way things are supposed to be. It's not the way things move well. Or maybe you just had this for Christmas, pulling out the Christmas lights for the the seventh time that you've been using these and, and this time it's just a disaster and they're all entangled with one another and it's almost impossible to, to pull them out. But then I have to throw a medical one in here too. Um, this is actually uh, tau tangles, they're called, tau tangles. It's what causes Alzheimer's dementia. It blocks transmission of memories and so forth in, in there. So even entanglement in the brain is not a good thing. This is what the writer of Hebrews is getting at, um, the idea of entanglement and how sin entangles us and ensnares us and keeps us from running the race. Now, there's two ways to of sin. One is kind of in the big sense of we need Jesus to save us from our sin in the big capital letter S, saving. But then there's also this little S saving, so to speak, from sin on a daily basis. That we don't get tripped up and entangled with the sins that we commit in our lives or the sins of others into our lives, this daily kind of battle of running the race that we are called, each one of us is called to run. So the writer of Hebrews is encouraging the people that he's writing to, and it's believed it's written to um, Jews who had just converted over to Christianity, but Christianity was a much more not tolerated religion in the Roman Empire. Judaism was. Um, the Jews and the Romans had a, a fairly good working relationship with each other. That was really unhealthy for the Jews and how this, this worked. But Christianity, they were getting persecuted. They were getting uh, killed, not the Jews. They were protected. So a lot of the Jews that became Christians started to defect and go back to Judaism because their friends were getting killed and the threat for them to get killed. And so the writer of Hebrews is saying, no, 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 don't defect. 
finish your race. We are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily entangles. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So it's a call to endure the sin in this world, but then also the sin that we commit um, as, as well. And it's a beautiful picture that he's painting here. Of Chapter 11 was about the uh, hall of faith with Moses and Abraham and Sarah and all those others. And this comes right out of that. Just think, others have raced and have finished their race already. You can too. They did it. You can too. Be encouraged with this. But let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily entangles. Now, I don't say this very often, but the ESV gets it wrong here, in my opinion. There's, there's a Greek word that they, they drop out um, on here. It's the article, the definite article before sin. So it doesn't just say sin, which would make us think of individual specific little sins, but it says the sin. And so there's a particular thing that the author had in mind. And if you look at the rest of the book of Hebrews, it doesn't talk much about specific sins. What it really talks about, either belief or unbelief. So the thought is, is that the, the sin is really unbelief. Now, I would argue that every little sin or other sin is an offshoot of unbelief as well, where we kind of turn our back on God and don't believe Him that this is not the best thing for us and we go our, our, own, our own way. So the sin there is unbelief, unfaithfulness, if you will, choosing to do our own thing contrary to God. The sin, which so easily entangles. We're told to, to lay aside. Now, there's different ways to translate that too. It could be put away or put off in different places. Put off the old self, put on the new. Put away the old, put on the new. Um, so it's the same kind of, of language here. Lay aside, put off, or put away. So the question is, how do we do that? What does that look like in our daily kind of life? Well, the next verse tells us in verse 2 of chapter 12. He says, Look to Jesus, or looking to Jesus to continue the thought from before, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So the key, he says, is look at Jesus. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus. It's when we take our eyes off Jesus that we get entangled and that we get ensnared with sin in this world. Jesus did this. He focused on the Father the, the whole way. And this enduring the cross is not just this one episode of his crucifixion. The bigger understanding is his whole life was carrying a cross, so to speak, so that the, the very end was just kind of the finale of this is what I've been doing my entire life. Jesus is carrying this burden, this weight. So enduring the cross, despising the shame for the joy that was set before him. He kept his eyes fixed ahead on the promises of God, the promises for him and the promises for us as well. And so we get to look back and we get to understand, you know, he did die for us. He was raised from the dead. He did ascend into heaven. And we believe that by faith. So I shared the story is, is kind of the, the quintessential, the, the, the story that I go to every single time for explaining the gospel. Um, and that was the, the two lost sons. I did that on Sunday. This is the story I go to if I ever want to talk about faith, or at least the first one to go to. Now, this is a story from Matthew 14, and it's of Peter walking on water. We've talked about this before. So you know the story. They're in a storm on the, uh, the Sea of Galilee, and they're afraid that they're going to get capsized and they're going to die. And Jesus comes walking by, walking on water. And Peter realizes in his brilliance that it's probably safer to be with Jesus than it is to be in this boat with all these guys. And so he asks Jesus to call him out because he's not going to step out onto the water, which represents evil and sin and chaos. Jesus is on top of it. It's not affecting him at all. He's not sinking in evil and sin and chaos. And so 
Jesus says yes, and Peter gets out of the boat and he walks on water toward him. Until what happens? Until he takes his eyes off Jesus and he sees the wind and the waves, the chaos, the sin, the brokenness, the world, if you will. But the point is, his gaze is off Jesus now and he sinks. But what does Jesus do immediately? He reaches for him and grabs him. He could have been 40 feet away, 10 10 feet away, we don't know, but Jesus is instantly right there, not going to let him drown. He's going to hold him fast. Jesus is going to hold him fast and not let him drown. This is the picture of faith and what unbelief is or doubt or um, unfaithfulness, if you will. We were using that language earlier um, as well. But taking your eyes off off Jesus. So this is what the author of Hebrews is saying. Don't take your eyes off Jesus. Don't get distracted by the things of this world. Instead, consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. So this idea of, of faith, by the way, what's the definition of faith in the book of Hebrews? It's the only place that actually gives us a definition of faith. Anybody remember what that is? Yeah, yeah, that's a good paraphrase of it. It's the, the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. So the assurance and conviction, there's a deep-seated belief that these things are true even though I can't see them or prove them. I believe them wholeheartedly that they're true. So what the author is saying, that what that looks like in day-to-day life is to consider, which means to, to meditate and think about and be aware of be present, if you will, with the living God who's with you through the Holy Spirit. The one who's endured from sinners such hostility against him. He knows. This idea, this is, this is a, a word of comfort. It's like Jesus knows. He's coming alongside you. He's gone through this. He'll get you through this. He will hold you fast till the end. He's not going to let you go. Don't give up. Fight. Put off sin and unbelief so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. If we're weary and faint-hearted, it's often because our eyes are off Jesus and we're getting entangled in sin and we're getting tripped up and we're falling on our faces and busting our noses and skinning our knees and our elbows and hurting ourselves left and right. Trying to take steps with, with things wrapped around us and we just can't move forward because our eyes are off Jesus and we're focused on the world instead of Him. So we're called to run with endurance. There's going to be sin in this world until Christ comes back again. We're going to contribute to that sin. So there's a need for us to run with endurance by considering and keeping our eyes on Jesus of Nazareth who holds us fast. Heavenly Father, we thank You for these words midweek to remind us of our need for You and our need to keep our eyes focused on you and to be attentive to your presence in our life at all times, not to get distracted by the things of this world, but to engage the things of this world through you and through your Holy Spirit and through your word. So thank you for the gift of your Spirit who is with us and for us today and tomorrow and the next. In Jesus' name that we pray this. Amen.